Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, we're going to be covering more material from my microbiology class. These are the kind of study videos so I could go back and watch them before the exam, which is this upcoming Tuesday. So let's get started here with bacterial genetics. And before we get started into the actual um, definitions and terms, we do have a bit of a history slide. We have this scientist named Barb, or Barbara McClintock. And her work is important because she looked at these varieties of corn with different colored kernels. And she realized they weren't predicted um, or they weren't inherited in a predictable manner. So the genes for these seem to have segments of DNA that moved in and out of genes involved in color. These appeared to jump back and forth, and when they jumped, this destroyed the function of those genes. And so, um, she published her work in 1950, but this was met with skepticism due to the unfortunate societal um, prejudices against women in science, and also to the fact that DNA was believed to be stable. So unfortunately, she got a lot of skepticism because of her gender, as well as DNA was thought to be stable. And in 1983, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the dump, the transposons or the jumping genes. All right, so more on that later. Let's actually start getting into some definitions here. So that was our precursor. That's just one story in the whole world of bacterial genetics. Let's now talk about some of the major definitions and factors involved. So we, of course, have natural selection. And this is going to, again, be constant evolution. And surviving um, factors will contribute to organisms that are known as the fittest. So again, survival of the fittest, they just so happen to have a mutation that codes for a phenotype or a protein that gave them some sort of advantage in retrospect of the selective pressures in the environment. And bacteria do this rapidly by gene expression and a change in the genotype. will be caused by a change in the DNA. However, bacteria are haploid. So they don't have two copies of the chromosome like we do. We only have one copy in the bacteria. And this means no backup. We have two copies since we're diploid. So when we have something like, let's say, um, a heterozygote in a diploid organism, well, that recessive trait used by the little x in the um, genotype, that won't result in the recessive phenotype. But since bacteria are haploid, none of those hiding instances with the phenotype will occur often. 
Alright, so again, there could also be a change in the phenotype. And of course this is observable. Alrighty. Let's get rid of that. Now let's go back into um, two modes of gaining these changes in genetics. We have mutation as well as horizontal gene transfer. In bacteria, they could do both of these, but in humans, for example, we could only have mutations. We cannot use horizontal gene transfer. Mutation, there is, of course, a spontaneous change. In the DNA, and this change will be passed down to the offspring or the progeny. The other copy, however, since this is just going to be um, passing down a spontaneous mutation, when we find a certain cell from the original that has this mutation, there's of course going to be um, binary fission and then that cell will split into two. So one of them will actually be affected, the other one will not. So the other copy is okay. For example, if we have this bacteria and let's say the original DNA is green, we go under binary fission, so now we have two cells. This one may still have that green DNA, the original, but then one on the right has a spontaneous mutation. So when this one splits off, its offspring or the progeny will also have that spontaneous mutation. Whereas the ones that result from the cell on the left will not have that mutation. Horizontal gene transfer involves the um, instance where another bacteria will pass along a plasmid. Plasmids are again those extra small circular pieces of DNA that bacteria by chance sometimes have and they have different effects such as when they're um, put through the central dogma so when they're transcribed and then translated into a protein sometimes this allows for the bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics or other effects like that so again it's just accessory small circular DNA that they're able to pass down and once the bacteria receives a plasmid the plasmid is now passed down Right, so in this instance, let's say we have, again, the bacteria here. Let me just draw them, and then we'll talk about which ones are actually going to be transferring and whatnot. All right, so this one originally does have a plasmid. And when it comes into contact with this species on the right here, it does not have a plasmid. So when they do a plasmid transfer, now this one also has... A plasmid and then when this bacteria here the one that received the plasmid from the one on the left goes under binary fission now its progeny also have that plasmid and this is a large problem from again antibiotic resistance this could increase the chance of the bacteria having those genes Alright, now let's talk about genetic change and phenotypes specifically. Alright, so an example would be the deletion of the tryptophan, which is an amino acid synthesis gene and if we delete 
that gene for tryptophan synthesis, the mutant will only grow when TRP or tryptophan is present in the medium or in the culture. So this is called trip minus. This is the name of the mutant now, trip minus. This mutant is an oxytroph. And that word just means it has a special need for nutrition. So oxo means increase and troph means nourishment. And therefore, this minus sign next to trip for this specific mutant means it can't make tryptophan, so therefore it will only grow when tryptophan is present. Prototroph, on the other hand, this is the wild type of the bacteria. This means this one can make tryptophan. It does have that gene. Wasn't mutated. Alrighty. Let's talk about spontaneous mutations now. Okay, so spontaneous again, this means it happens on its own just by chance. These are random mutations. And these ha occur at characteristic rates. One of the first terms will be, of course, the mutation rate. And this is the probability of move of mutation at each division. So in general, it's between 10 to the negative fourth power and 10 to the negative 12th for a gene, for a given gene. And the mutations, when they're passed to progeny, this is called our vertical transfer. So horizontal gene transfer is the plasma goes from one bacterial cell to another, while mutation is just the passing the passing down of the material by binary fission that's vertical we also have something called a reversion mutant and what's cool about these bacteria they are able to change back to the wild type They're able to kind of autocorrect themselves in certain, in certain instances. Large populations, of course, will probably have mutants. And the environment is the force behind the selection of mutants. For example, again, if we have an antibiotic placed on the agar plate, only bacteria with resistant genes will develop. All right, and if they do have that gene that carries that specific resistance and they're that condition this of course gives them an advantage alrighty let's now talk about a type of spontaneous mutation this is going to be called base substitution And this is the most common type. One base is change 
And some examples in humans would be eye color, skin color, as well as hair color. A point mutation, however, is the change in a single pair of bases. So if an A and a T became a C and a G, that's point mutation. The three outcomes of base substitution are silent, missense, and the last one is nonsense. In silent, the um, amino acid will still be the wild type. Nothing changes there. Still the same amino acid that will be coded by that DNA once transcription and translation are in effect. Missense is when a different amino acid will occur, but there's only partial peptide function. So it only affects it a tiny bit when it's missense. However, when it, we get nonsense, this mutation in the base substitution, this causes the stop codon to appear, and the protein is therefore rendered short as well as non-functional. Alrighty, now let's go over deletions and additions of nucleotides. Alright, so the thing here that affects it the most is the number of bases affected. And this determines, of course, the impact. If three are added, this causes a change in one codon, and then therefore one amino acid more or less than normal. And then the impact here is further driven by the location of that change in the amino acid, whether there's an extra one there or not, that could be um, determined in its severity by where it happened. However, if we only adding one or two pairs, this causes the frame shift mutation. And this creates a different set of codons, therefore again a short and a non-functional protein, so technically we could just go like this, copy it over, it's going to be in the same effect there, and we get something called a knockout effect. It's another key term there. The frame shift is also known as a knockout mutation. All right, let's talk about mutations that are caused by a stimuli, not randomly, but because of this stimuli, we're going to get this mutation. So these are known as induced. These, again, result by outside stimuli. And one of the causes would be known as a mutagen. This is the agent that causes that mutation to happen. And sometimes you could even use them to control mutation rate in genetics, genetics studies. There are two types, there's chemical or radiation.
So chemical causes or chemical mutagens, they may cause base, subs, or frame shifts. Then their effects include on the nucleobases, where they all change the pairing properties. Okay, so this will increase the chance of incorrect pairing. And then again, we do not want to break the rules in the code of DNA. For example, nitrous acid HNO2 will convert cytosine into uracil. Therefore, this will create a base pair with adenine. So C will then bond with A instead of G. And it's because that C is now a U, so that's one way of using a chemical to induce a mutation. Another one is nitro. So guanidine. And this will add a methyl, so CH3, to regular guanine. And therefore, this will now pair with T, and that's incorrect as well. Base analogs are also an effect of chemical mutagens. These are looking extremely similar to the bases themselves, but they have a different hydrogen bonding property. Do we mean by that? Well, um, they could be mistakenly incorporated by DNA polymerase. And we have an example here of 5 bromo uracil, which looks like a thymine. So, but instead of that CH3, that methyl group, we have a BR, a bromine on there. And this will base pair, again, incorrectly with guanidine, this base analog. So again, we do not want that. It breaks the rules of the bases pairing. We also have something called 2-aminopurine. And then this looks like adenine. This incorrectly base pairs with cytosine, another rule that has been broken. So base analogs caused by chemical mutagens. Very dangerous stuff. They're also intercalating agents. But these do, they cause frame shifts. So these flat molecules will push the bases. And then when they insert themselves and push, this creates space. And then, of course, the space causes errors in replication. One of the common intercalating agents would be used in gel electrophoresis when preparing those gels to look at a fluorescent dye. We have something called ethidium bromide. And what happens here? The DNA helps. And again, the DNA will be affected by this. There's replication errors, however. This helps in electrophoresis to show the bands.
Alrighty, the next section would be to talk about the different types of radiation. So let's change to a different color. Our first type of radiation would be the um, ultraviolet light. And I'm writing in blue. Let's change it to a violet color. Stay with the theme. So UV, of course, this makes thymine dimers. This is when a thymine will bond with a thymine right next to it. And this cannot fit into the um, double helix. This creates a distortion to the helix of DNA. And the covalent bond formed between the dimer is very strong. This stalls replication as well as the dogma and therefore this causes death of the cell. One way it's fixed is through SOS. This is again a last effort, a last ditch effort. Sometimes during SOS repair with the DNA um, you'll get even more errors so this is really messy and again last ditch. Another type of radiation that could affect DNA is X-ray. And this will create singular and a double, double-stranded breaks. And lethal deletions. Alrighty, now let's look at what happens if you uh, fail to repair. So if if repair fails, then this will cause cell death in microbes or cancer in humans, other animals, etc. So when the DNA polymerase um, incorporates the wrong mo the wrong nucleotide this will cause again a distortion and so mutation is prevented by repair before replication there are two mechanisms for this. First one is mismatch repair. And this uh, mechanism, this is when the incomplete ba the incorrect base is added, and then an enzyme cuts the backbone and then a second enzyme will now snip out the region methyl will mark the template strand Finally, ligase plus polymerase will add in the correct bases and seal up the cracks. So in the image, let's say we have A and A, G, and here we have T, T, A. This is incorrect, so what would happen is the and I just draw it again really quickly. So this A would be removed. Then this whole section will be cut somewhere on the unmethylated strand. So 
this strand here would be correct. This is the template, so CH3. Then we would get rid of first the base itself, then the region. And then DNA polymerase will come in and add that correct base. This is a new correct base added by polymerase. And then ligase will come in and seal that up. We also have the enzyme glycosylase as a source of repair. This enzyme will remove, oxidize bases, something like guanidine bond to an oxygen. Here we have enzyme cut site. Then, of course, ligase and polymerase are going to now repair. So it seems a lot quicker, doesn't it? It's the same idea. Remove the base, then cut, and then go back in there. All right, now let's talk about the repair of the thymine dimers. So this is going to be dimer repair. Alrighty, so we have the photoreactivation mechanism. It's called photoreactivation because there's an enzyme that uses light. To then go in and start breaking covalence. This is only seen in bacteria. And then the covalence that we're talking about are the dimer covalence between the thymine. And then this is bacteria only. Humans, again, don't have this. Please stay out of tanning booths and make sure to protect yourself from the sun or other sources of UV. We do not have photo reactivation, unfortunately, so we gotta do our best out there. There's also excision repair. of a dimer. This is without light. Same thing happens, enzyme removes the dimer and then ligase and polymerase seal up the cracks. All right, last one here for dimer repair is of course SOS repair. This is our last ditch situation we talked about briefly earlier, and this will stall the DNA or RNA polymerase. At the sites where we see the air of the dimer and then several genes. Activate in the SOS system. And when this happens, DNA polymerase will synthesize the damaged areas. Then there's no proofreading. Therefore, this is immediately a, a, last, a last stand event. This might cause even more errors and make the problem even worse for the DNA, the machinery. All right, let's talk about how to select a mutant because they're extremely rare. We need some techniques to do so. Alright, one of the first methods of, of course, direct selection. This is where you would inoculate 
on a medium that supports the mutant. All right, so what do I mean by support? So let's say again, we have an agar plate and we're going to put an antibiotic agar on here. So if we're looking for the mutant that has resistance, so let's say it's R plus resistance. All right, when we put a bunch of our bacteria here, let's say, uh, Genta or this pink color will be the resistant ones and the blue dots will be the wild type that aren't resistant to this antibiotic on the plate Well, when we move from the culture onto the plate, this is what's going to happen. Just the mutant will be left That's direct substitute the direct selection not substitution. Sorry about that direct selection Man, I need to get my words together, don't I? All right, indirect is where you would use velvet or another materia, material to isolate the oxytroph. And you're looking for the cell or the bacteria that doesn't have any growth. because you're doing a comparison of two scenarios in order to isolate the oxytro or the mutant. And this will come from a phototrophic parent. And that means it's actually supposed to be an R, not an H. Sorry about that, prototrophic parent. And that means from the wild type. All right, so what will happen here is replica planting. With again, with like a cloth material, usually velvet. Now they have specific um, films to use. And you're just again doing a comparison between two plates the one colony or the one isolated bacteria that's missing that will be your mutant between the two we also have ways of screening for carcinogens with bacteria so carcinogens cause cancers of course most of them are mutagens and the mutagens increase the rate of reversions. That's the, again, the bacteria's ability to revert to the wild type. They don't become mutants anymore. They become the wild type. One of the tests that could be run is known as the Ames test. In the Ames test, you'll measure the effect of the chem on reversion rate. Of the histidine requiring salmonella. So again, this is a mutant his minus. It needs histidine. So therefore, it's an oxytroph. And then this uses direct selection and if it's mutagenic the reversion rate will increase and this increase the startling increase will actually tell us it's a carcinogen All right, now let's talk about horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer, again, bacteria only. First, we need some definitions, a replicon. This is any DNA that is capable of replicating because it has an origin of replication.
For example, these are going to, of course, be plasmids and chromosomes. Homologous That's a horrible curse of their fake cursive recombination. This is the process by which um, DNA fragments can be added to a chromosome. And this only happens if the sequence is similar to the recipient. And the recipient's genome. Okay, so this doesn't require an origin. Just this match. And of course, once this happens, this recombination happens, this is passed down to the progeny. The affected cell. Okay, so the experiment that led to the discovery of transformation was conducted by a scientist named Fred Griffith. He went into this um, lab and he demonstrated the transformation in pneumonia bacteria, so pneumococci. And so their capsule pneumonia, new, uh, pneumonia, pneumonia um, bacteria, sorry I'm getting a little bit sleepy here, but so when the these bacteria had capsules, this means that they are pathogenic, and dead capsules or dead pneumonia bacteria that had capsules were mixed with live ones that didn't have capsules. So those couldn't cause disease. For some reason, this instance led into a pathogenic effect on the mouse. So the mouse died when that happened. So this must mean there must be something being transferred from those dead capsule containing pneumococci to the live non-capsule ones. And it was figured out that naked DNA was the culprit. So DNA left behind by the capsule pneumococci was being taken in. This was figured out by a bunch of other scientists and how they figured out it was DNA. They treated the extracts with a DNA course that's an enzyme that works on DNA so when they added the DNA this of course broke down that naked DNA and this stopped the transformation of those originally non-virulent bacteria could also talk about transduction And this is when genes are transferred via a bacteriophage. And that's a type of virus that affects bacteria. All right, there's two types. There's specific and general lies. If you want to be technical, generalize, but a general type of thing. And this, of course, transfers specific genes. This transfers any gene to the donor. All right, so let's look at generalized. 
generalized transduction first. The bacterial phage will go to the surface of the bacteria. So bacteria phage to surface. And of course, it adheres itself to the host. Number two, the phage DNA will enter the cell. So that little squiggle will be the DNA entering. And it's going to inject it to the bacteria chromosome. Number three, we're going to have translation. And then this will create nucleases that will kill the bacterial chromosome. So there's going to be all these translated proteins that are from the phage DNA, and it's going to become like a murder scene where there's going to be the chopped up chromosome of the host in number three. So I should move this up. Number four, we're going to have the DNA of the bacteriophage will be translated. So this squiggle, that's the, remember, that's the um, invading bacteria, the bacteriophage's DNA that it had. So this is going to become a protein. When that happens, of course, more viruses may be made that might be the protein coat. So the cell, the host cell will burst and the host DNA might still be trapped in one of those phages, who knows? A little piece of it might have been there. So DNA of host may also leave here at this point. So cell burst, out go all of these new phages with the DNA and from all those dogma steps that's the cell bursting with all these phages sometimes original DNA might get out of there a new cell is then hijacked we'll just continue it here from one of these newly created bacteria phages so get a new cell here let's make this one's DNA green its chromosome will be green just to tell the difference number seven this is the homologous combination that we talked about earlier this will remove the host the second host original chromosome all right, so here, homologous recombination, that's gonna be canceled out basically. And then number eight, this is the final step. So now the progeny will only have some of the first host genetic material or gene. So now I'll have that. So that's the whole process how transduction could work in the generalized form. The last mode will be conjugation. This is contact dependence, so direct contact between two cells of a bacteria. And then, of course, there's a sex pillus. This is where the gene it's going to be transferred. This is where the plasmid is going to be transferred. There's always going to be, again, a donor and a, re and a receiver. All right, so in this situation, we have something called the F plasmid. This is the plasmid that codes for the sex pillus. And it will go to the recipient, an F minus bacteria. spelt that wrong, the wrong word too. 
All right, they conjugate plasmid, however, directs its own transfer. This is self-transferring. Again, this is a replicon. Because it has its own origin of replication, it's able to self-replicate. And the F-plasmid fertility of E. coli is well studied. And this causes resistance to be spread in a dangerous level. So how does this work? Let's see. So if we have the E. coli that are F plus and F minus, let's just draw them here, plus minus. This one has the plasmid for the sex pillus. The F pillus is now formed, so plasmid to pillus, and then the plasmid is now cut. So how am I going to show that? I'm just going to redraw it, make a slash through it like that, so plasmid gets cut. And the strand, one strand of it is replicated. right and then that will move over the single strand will go into here into the into the receiver and then now both of the cells are now F plus because now both of them have a copy of that plasmid that codes for a sex pillus Again, this is how resistance is sometimes spread. Chromosomal DNA is also uncommon to be transferred. It could still happen through conjugation. This involves the HFR. So this is again plasmid to chromosome. Still under conjugation, though. That's a good point to make. There are HFR cells. These are going to be involved. High frequency recombination. That's what that stands for. The process is reversible. All right, let's get into it. The um, F prime plasmid. This is a new type will be the piece of chromosome and this piece will be removed with F plasmid DNA. Okay, let me decode what I meant there. The F prime plasmid is created when a small piece of the chromosome is removed with F plasmid DNA. So instead of just the F plasmid being transferred, you also get a piece of the chromosome in the uh, plasmid that's now moved over. The F prime is also a replicon. All right, now let's talk about the mobile gene pool very quickly. The main thing here is that 75% of E. coli are similar in their DNA. Should probably move this over so it looks nicer. The rest of that 
25%. That isn't the core genome, it is the mobile gene pool. And this is, of course, the plasmid, the transposon, genomic islands, or phage DNA. Those are the mobile gene pool. Okay, let's talk about plasmids a little bit more in depth. Again, there are some in Eukarya, actually. Which was kind of surprising to me. So they're double-stranded DNA with an origin of replication. And when they are lost, the cell still survives. And there's a high copy number. There's usually 500 per cell. There's a narrow host range. But some include both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Some of them are just increased virulence, toxin production, oil degradation, nitrogen fixation, tumor formation, and of course, antibiotic resistance being a large one, affecting Escherichia coli, Salmonella, Neisseria, Staphylococcus, and Shigella, so a ton of dangerous bacteria that are becoming extremely pathogenic and resistant to our antibodies. Speaking of the resistance, resistance plasmids, or R plasmids, these are going to help resist heavy metals when they're put through the central dogma. These are broad range. And normal species can actually transfer them. All right, so let's look at one of these. So here's a plasmid. Um, we have a resistance here. Resistance here to different, um, again, to different substances. This one is carbenicillin. This one is uh, chloramphenicol. I don't know how to say that. We have pill is producing, then we have the origin of transfer, or the OT, origin of replication, OR, we have another resistance here, then that's all, all those things are on that one R plasmid, ton of resistances. All right, let's talk about transposons. Oops, didn't select the highlighter by accident, whoops. All right, these are again moving or jumping from gene to gene. And when this happens, uh, the process is called transposition. When we have a transposon, transposable element, here it is. That's gene one, and then we're going to move it to gene X on this plasmid. This causes gene X to be disruptive. So it's disrupted. So I'm going to put a sad face. This causes inactivation of a gene. The one that the transposon lands onto will be inactivated. The simplest transposon is called the insertion sequence. And this only codes for the transposase enzyme. Enzyme again, transposase, and then inverted 
repeat composite transposons. Sorry about that. These code for more genes. Or they include more genes, I should say. And then this is non homologous recombination. For example, we could have insertion, then an antibiotic resistance gene, and then insertion again, all on the same uh, transposon. So this is, would be composite. All right. Finally, let's go to um, again talking about some um, antibiotic resistance. Of course, the patient could be um, looking at their intestinal bacteria. So looking at the intestine and its microbiota, we will probably find some resistant um, cells. And if there's the um, re resistance gene on a transposon, the staphylococcus may gain it. So then the transposon will move to the staph's own plasmid. And now the staph is antibiotic resistant as well. Final section is conjugation with plants, of all things. This is the interesting and kind of scary uh, thing happening with a lot of companies um, where they're doing all these biotech stuff, this weird biotech stuff using plants. So this is, again, natural genetic engineering. So the TI plasmid is the example here and it creates a, a crown gall the bacteria agrobacterium creates a crown gall and a piece of the uh, plasmid called tdna is transferred to the plant the the hormones are coded for by this. And then those are growth hormones for the plant, and therefore the plasmid is incorporated into the plant chromosome via non homologous, again, recombination. All right, so you could actually grow a new plant from a cell. And you could do this with genes that, again, have plant hormones. So there's a funny plant, I guess. And now it has this crown gall. Those are hormones in there from the bacteria, the TI plasmid. All right, that's going to do it for this presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in. Good night to all of you. And please do something nice for someone. Take care.